August 9th. Inflating tensions. The United States struggles under pressure of possible economic downfall. Pollution lockdowns. India sees effects of rising toxicity as pollution deals a blow on daily life. Jab discrimination. Austria prevents free movement for the unvaccinated in the latest effort to inoculate. Splash of colour. Lima's neighbourhoods see rainbows on walls and streets as artists get together in fighting stigmas. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the United States. President Biden's major infrastructure plan will soon be going into full effect with the government, hoping it will adequately fund better structural stability. However, the rest of his plans may go awry as inflation continues to mount. President Biden's massive infrastructure plan will finally become law Monday. The legacy-defining legislation kicking off upgrades to the nation's roads, bridges, rails, and airports. We can still come together to get something big done for the American people. Marking the moment with a large signing ceremony, flanked by Democrats and Republicans on the South Lawn. The motion is adopted. All GOP lawmakers who backed the $1.2 trillion bill were invited, but it's unclear how many will attend. A celebration for part of the president's economic agenda, while the rest is in jeopardy, with soaring inflation a top concern for the Biden administration. Everything from a gallon of gas to a loaf of bread costs more, and it's worrisome. There's no doubt inflation is high right now. It's affecting Americans' pocketbooks. It's affecting their outlook. Uh, and that's a problem we have to deal with. White House officials are confident the president's larger social and climate package can pass the House this week. But the Senate is another story, as West Virginia's Joe Manchin has repeatedly expressed concerns about new spending amid high consumer prices. The nation's economic disconnect reflected in a sinking approval rating for the president, according to the latest Washington Post ABC poll hitting a new low, with only 41 percent supporting the job he's doing. U.S. President Joe Biden put the blame on COVID pressures when faced with backlash about the steep inflation rates that seem to be increasing, stating that it was not due to the current administration's strategies. Seeing some big increases in when prices. When does it get better? When U.S. President Joe Biden's economic advisors defended his policies on Sunday saying rising inflation is a global issue related to the COVID-19 pandemic, not a result of the administration's programs. U.S. consumer prices last week posted their biggest annual gain in 31 years, driven by surges in the cost of gasoline and other goods. Republicans have pounced on inflation worries, claiming that the increase reflects Biden's sweeping spending agenda. On Monday, Biden is scheduled to sign a $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill that is expected to create jobs across the country to fix crumbling bridges and roads and expand broadband Internet access. In separate television appearances Sunday, White House National Economic Council Director Brian Deese and U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said they expect the measure, as well as the yet-to-be-voted-on Build Back Better bill, will help bring down inflation. When the economy recovers enough from COVID that demand patterns, people go back to eating out, traveling more, spending more on services, and the demand for products, for goods, um, begins to go back uh, to normal. Yellen added that she expects prices to go back to normal by the second half of 2022, if the pandemic continues to wane. Deese said he was confident that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi would bring Biden's $1.75 trillion Build Back Better domestic spending plan to a vote this week. The White House regularly cites support for the Build Back Better plan from 17 Nobel laureates who say it will ease longer-term inflation. That will only be a first step, however, as the Senate has not yet taken up the bill and Democratic divisions could threaten its chances in that chamber. Still in the United States, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and his Chinese counterpart held phone talks to discuss preparations for this week's virtual summit between President Biden and President Xi. While they acknowledged the importance of the upcoming summit, they also exchanged some harsh words regarding Taiwan. 
Ahead of the highly anticipated virtual summit between the leaders of the U.S. and China, the top diplomats of the two countries have spoke over the phone. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken used the opportunity to express concern over Beijing's continued military, diplomatic and economic pressure against Taiwan. According to the State Department, Blinken also emphasized a long-standing U.S. interest in peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. He also urged China to take part in meaningful dialogue to resolve issues in a peaceful manner. In response, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi called on Washington to clearly and resolutely oppose any moves in Taiwan for independence. Such sharp remarks come as relations between Beijing and Taipei are at their lowest points in decades, with strong rhetoric and increased military posturing. On the upcoming Biden-Xi summit, Wang stressed its great significance not only for U.S.-China relations, but also for international relations. Blinken also stressed the meeting presents an opportunity for the superpowers to discuss how to manage competition between the two countries while ensuring close coordination and cooperation in areas where their interests align. The summit between Presidents Biden and Xi slated to be held on Monday evening Washington time and Tuesday morning in Beijing is the first between the leaders since President Biden entered the White House in January. New Delhi authorities announced a one-week closure of schools and said that they would consider a pollution lockdown to protect citizens from toxic smog. For more on this, we have Abhidhar Nawal, your special correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekar, reporting from Delhi in India. For more, Gayatri. Yes, Shanali. Delhi's Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal said schools will be shut so children don't have to breathe polluted air. Delhi is ranked one of the world's most populated cities with hazardous melange of factory and vehicle emissions and smoke from agricultural fires settling the skies over its 20 million people each winter. Chief Minister said that pollution lockdown has never happened before and that it will be an extreme step. He also said that construction activity would be halted for four days to cut down dust from vast open sites. Government officers were asked to operate from home and private businesses advised to stick to work from home options as much as possible. Delhi's government has been vowing, to, uh, vowing for years to clean up the city's air. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned of an impeding climate catastrophe, while environmental campaigner Greta Thunberg dismissed the COP26 climate conference deal as with an iconic blah, blah, blah. After last-minute drama in Scotland to clinch agreement, even those who welcomed the deal in Glasgow said a huge amount of work remained to be done. Already pushed back by an extra day of tough negotiations, Delegates arriving for the closing plenary of the COP26 climate summit faced yet another delay as major coal users India and China forced a change to the agreement's text to phase down instead of phase out the use of coal and fossil fuel subsidies. But we are disappointed. The last-minute weakening of the deal sparked a chorus of disappointment and anger, leading COP President Alok Sharma to issue an emotional apology. I'm deeply sorry. I also understand the, the deep disappointment. But I think, as you have noted, it's also vital that we um, protect this package. Still, the summit did achieve a historic agreement, the first of its kind to call for a reduction in fossil fuels. Sharma's primary goal had been to keep alive the target set by the 2015 Paris Climate Accords to maintain global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. Climate advocates had called that goal far from sufficient. Current emissions pledges put the world on track for a likely catastrophic 2.4 degrees of warming. The deal brought yet more disappointment for vulnerable nations as rich countries, including the EU and the US, blocked concrete action on compensating them for climate-related loss and damages. Greenpeace called the COP26's agreement meek and weak, with campaigners like Greta Thunberg dismissing it as empty talk. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the agreement an important step, but warned that the world is still knocking on the door of climate catastrophe. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
Welcome back. South Korea's vice foreign minister is expecting a positive outcome in regards to President Moon Jae-in's recent proposal to formally declare an end to the 1950-1953 Korean War. He made the remarks as they departed from Washington for talks with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts. South Korea's vice foreign minister says good news is expected regarding the declaration of a formal end to the Korean War. First Vice Foreign Minister Choi jong gon told reporters at Washington Dulles International Airport on Sunday that the most important factor is that South Korea and the U.S. reach an agreement in terms of the means of ending the war. Choi said the two countries agree on pushing ahead with Seoul's proposal to declare formally ending the war, but are discussing how and when it could be done. He also said that results are expected soon, after which the proposal will be shared with North Korea. Choi added that another important factor to consider is the North's reaction to the agreement and then how to move forward with the regime from there. In an answer to the question over the possibility of a positive response from Pyongyang, he said that it cannot be guaranteed. The vice minister departed for Washington on Sunday for talks with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts. There, he'll hold a three-way meeting with the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and Japan's Vice Foreign Minister Mori Takeo on Tuesday local time. This is the first vice ministerial meeting involving the three countries in four months. They previously met in Japan in July. Expected issues on the agenda include the proposed declaration of an official end to the 1950-1953 Korean War and tackling global supply chain crisis. The Queen of England has missed the Remembrance Sunday service at the Setophon in London as she has sprained her back. Buckingham Palace said that the monarch was disappointed not to attend the event. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Dilini Senmi Ratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. Dilini. Yes, Shanali. The palace previously said it was the Queen's firm intention to attend the service after taking time away from her duties for health reasons. She made the decision to miss the event with great regret this morning, as in previous years, a wreath was laid on her behalf by Prince of Wales. The Queen's back sprain is unrelated to her doctor's recent advice to rest. Doctors had advised the monarch to rest until mid-November after she spent a night in hospital on 20th October for checks, her first overnight hospital stay in eight years. The Remembrance Sunday service would have been her first duty in public after her hospital stay last month. The Queen had maintained a typically busy schedule in October before being admitted to hospital but was recently seen using a walking stick at a Westminster Abbey service the first time she has done so at a major event. Last week, she was spotted driving her car near Windsor Castle in an area where she is known to take her corgi dogs out for walks. Back to you, Shinali. Thank you. And that was Adda Darana World News Special Correspondent Dilini Senri Ratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. Austria is placing millions of people not fully vaccinated against the coronavirus in lockdown as of today to deal with a surge in infections to record high levels. Lockdown for the unvaccinated, an extreme measure that Austria's chancellor says he does not take lightly. Our task is, as a federal government, to protect the people of Austria, and that's what we're doing. We're fulfilling that responsibility. If the incidence for vaccinated people is down, it continues to rise exponentially for the unvaccinated. Despite a small protest outside the Chancellery in Vienna, the restrictions take effect on Monday. According to the new rules, anyone over age 12 who either hasn't gotten the jab or who doesn't have immunity from a prior infection is barred from leaving their homes, with exceptions for essential tasks like grocery shopping or medical visits. Breaking the rules comes with the risk of a 500 euro fine. The restrictions, believed to be the first of their kind worldwide, come amid rising infection levels, felt across Central Europe and Germany. Countries where vaccination levels are in the lower to middle range when compared to the rest of Europe. In Austria, about 64% of the population has received both shots, compared to 67% for Germany and 69% for France. More than 13,000 new cases were recorded Saturday in Austria, a record since the pandemic began. Thousands flocked the streets in protests across Thailand, demanding immediate reform to the absolute monarchical system governing the country, despite the heavy charges imposed against such actions.
Thousands of Thais took to the streets of the capital, Bangkok, on Sunday, demanding reforms to the monarchy. Protesters marched, waving placards that read, No absolute monarchy and reform is not abolition. Demonstrations come after the country's highest court ruled last week that a call for reforms to the monarchy was unconstitutional and intended to topple the system. But one protester in Sunday's crowd said reform does not mean abolition. Authorities only want to do the things they want and see people with opposing views as the bad guys. So they think that we're trying to topple them. If society continues like this, how can we move forward? The youth-led protests that began last year are the biggest challenge in decades to the establishment, long dominated by the army and the palace. They have called for the removal of former coup leader Prime Minister Prayuth Chan Ochoa and reformed the powers of King Maha Vajira Longkorn. Protests have broken long-standing taboos of talking about monarchy reform in Thailand. Citizens face up to 15 years imprisonment for insulting or defaming the monarchy. At least 150 people have been charged since last year, according to records compiled by a legal human rights group. Scores of Sudanese protesters have been killed by military forces in the latest public attempt at rejecting the recent military coup across multiple cities within the unstable nation. Witnesses and medics say that several protesters have been killed in the mass demonstrations across cities in Sudan, protests against last month's military coup. Huge crowds have reportedly defied tear gas and gunfire, in the capital, witnesses say security forces moved in to disperse the protesters as soon as they began to gather on Saturday afternoon. On a hospital bed, this protester told us he knew the risk. People shouldn't stop, he's saying, and despite his injuries, he plans to rejoin the protests. He's ready to be a martyr and said his goodbyes before he left home. Back on the street, this protester says for decades, Sudan has been so backward compared to the rest of the world. Civilian democratic rule is the only way for our country to advance. The reports of fast reaction from security forces may be a sign that authorities are stepping up their efforts to squash protests and civil disobedience. Previously, they had waited until later in the day before moving in on the crowds. And a doctor's group, which is aligned with the protests, says that in one city, security forces stormed a hospital, beating the staff and arresting injured protesters there. Sudanese police say they haven't used firearms in the protests and that it began peacefully before turning violent. They say dozens of police were also injured and police stations attacked. The army chief, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, denies this is a coup and says the army intervened because of political turmoil and to safeguard the transition to democracy. Also in Sudan, the Al Jazeera TV network says its Sudan bureau chief was arrested in a night raid on his home. The news outlet says no reason was given to it for the arrest and is demanding his release. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A newly founded anti-corruption party held a narrow lead in parliamentarian vote count from Bulgaria's parliamentarian elections. Ferocious clashes have left 68 inmates dead in an Ecuador prison in the latest unrest at a jail that was the scene of a September riot which killed 119 prisoners. Global sales of electric vehicles came to roughly 3 million units in the first nine months of 2021 and South Korea ranked seventh largest in terms of sales, moving up one place from eighth place ranking for the previous two years. Hundreds of migrants attempted to cross the border and enter Poland after passing through the fence near Kuzunika Rungi checkpoint, the migrants sat across Polish border guards. Britain's COVID-19 booster vaccine rollout is to be extended to people aged between 40 and 49, officials said in a bid to boost waning immunity in the population ahead of the colder winter months. Israel is working for the release of an Israeli couple being held in Turkey, denying allegations carried by Turkish state media that the two were spies, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said.
And finally tonight, rainbow colors are splashed across small houses in a once gray neighborhood of Peru's capital city, creating the optical illusion of a large mural which can be seen from various vantage points across Lima. The project in Lima's Letical Hillside Barrio, aimed at improving the lives of those in the COVID-hit community and prompting tourism, is being headed by muralists Carla Megan and Daniel Manrick and has been five months in the making. They said that the hill was considered an unsafe area in the city and that the neighborhood was dangerous and so the duo decided to change that social stigma through art. Bright paintings adorn many buildings in the neighborhood and workers are busy daubing steps and stone walls in cheerful hues of yellow and orange. People in the community said that it has been their response as neighbors, residents and artists to try to generate and change in their neighborhood through the energy of color to improve the mood of their entire population still affected by COVID-19 and thus help their neighborhood develop in a sustainable way. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.